There is this particular book which uh, I'm sure many of you in this room have read. It's called The Folks Capitalism. And in this particular book, it suggests Dr. Dan O'Meara that clearly in the South African society, what, should, what we saw around the period after around 1930s or so was a lot of African capital being centralized in order to produce a system of saving money from the agricultural sector and then intermediating it through credit and investment systems in order to create new enterprises. At the same time, a lot of parallel investments by the state in strategic irrigation systems. And today at the Land Bank, we see that when you look at the spatial <coughs> geography of South Africa, there were very, very deliberate investment efforts to say we will invest irrigation in these and these and these areas because they represented the largest potential in terms of land quality and so on and so on. And then we talked about strong institutions. What we saw, and I can tell you now, even South African commercial agriculture today is still underpinned by the strength of the former cooperatives. They have changed shapes, many of them, to become private companies but they still serve the same purpose, i.e. to support their member organizations with very comprehensive set of services, from acquiring land, from ad to advise on seeds and inputs that you need, equipment, and so on and so on. As the saying goes, I remember arriving at the land bank in February 2015, and I met one guy who had been working there, and he said, TP, the one thing that you should be aware is that the farmer and the co-op are like this, inseparable. That is the strength of institutions uh, when you want to grow the agricultural sector. We talked about labor dynamics in terms of urban versus uh, hinterland dynamics. Now, the state, and I'm not saying we should go back there, intervened substantially in the agricultural sector as it was growing post around the 1930s and beyond through the Marketing Act, through various control boards. So a farmer would know that they can produce whatever amount of output and the state would buy it, and the state would then on sell it uh, for further processing. Those who farm livestock at the time knew they could take their animals to a government abattoir. Came 1994, liberalization happened, and some of the problems that we have today are that your typical emerging farmer, your typical average farmer who is black and new to the sector is struggling to find market access for their product. I'm not suggesting we should go back there. Now, the point that I was making about Africana capital being uh, accumulated or being centralized we can, an argument is made in this book to say some of the companies that we know today were actually created through the benefit of financial surplus created in the agricultural sector on the back of slave wages, you advocate, aggregated into an institution such as that one, Federal Folks Investment Holding Company or something, which then invested to create some of the companies that we know today. The role of agriculture in the economy, that's what I'm trying to talk to. Let's go forward. This is the opposite of what I've just talked about. And I can bet, uh, advocate, you might have read this book, I think. The book is called The Seed is Mine. It is about the story of a black person, a black person, this old man, who came from the eastern part of the Free State. I think he originally came from Lesotho, lived in the Fixbeck area, and he moved throughout the whole of the Free State province until he crossed the Val River and then ended up settling somewhere in the now northwest. Why was he moving from farm to farm? Because he was not prepared to be a wage laborer. Rather, his preference was to do sharecropping. So in other words, planting on other people's land instead of rather working as a laborer. 
So he would pitch up at an Afrikaner farmer's farm, let's say a thousand hectares, and he would share uh, uh, in farming the land and sharing in the crops. But here is the difference. In t instead of seeing the kind of benefits that we saw in terms of creating for himself or for his uh, family or for his generation enterprises, what we know is that his tenure was insecure because he was moving from one area to the other. In the second instance, the point was made earlier on by Ruth. No opportunity to accumulate capital because he's moving from end to end. Isolation, no institutional support mechanisms because he, the color of the skin was not the right one at the time. And by the way, we're talking this period here from around 1920 coming all the way. This person passed away, I think, in 1985 or so. Disrupted potential for creating an economic legacy, and most importantly, disrupted knowledge transfer. An average young Afrikaner farmer that I deal with today at the land bank is probably a third or a fourth generation farmer. There's been substantial knowledge transfer from one generation to the next. And this, for me, is probably the worst that could have ever happened of denying people knowledge over time. And this is a famous quote from him to say from this old man, the seed is mine, the plowshares is mine, the spell of oxen is mine, everything is mine, only the land is theirs. And I'm just, the reason why I, we did this at the land bank advocate was to try and appreciate the history of dispossession so that we have a, a deep sense of what we are talking about when we talk matters of land.